Hi everyone, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Choosing the Right GP Reporting Tool. We appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule to join us today. There are a couple of housekeeping items I would like to mention before we begin. All attendees are in listen-only mode, so if you have questions, you can either put them in the GoToWebinar question box, or you can sub or raise your hand and we can unmute your line. We will be answering questions throughout the presentation and also um, following up after to answer any additional questions. I'd like to introduce today's speaker. We have Chris Liley, who is a consulting manager here at Socius. So at this point, Chris, I believe we're ready to transi transition over to you. Great. Thank you. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, got a pretty jam-packed uh, presentation here for you today. It is a lot of slides. I'll go ahead and warn you up front. Um, so you will be getting a copy of this uh, webinar uh, pretty much on completion uh, when we get it ready. Uh, the agenda for today, really we're going to cover four main topics. One is reporting trends. Then we're going to talk about different decision factors uh, that we would uh, look at identifying to help us determine what could potentially be uh, a good fit for a tool for us. And then we'll look at the actual reporting options. So once we kind of know what those decision factors are, now we need to look at what options are available to me, uh, what tools are out there that I need to consider to potentially use as a tool for this particular report. And then at the end, I've got just two uh, example compare and contrasts, which are just some typical questions that you might get asked or you might ask, and how you could then look at what we've kind of talked about prior in the webinar to then see which tool might fit uh, to help us answer those particular questions. So I've got two of those at the end. So first up is the trends. So over the years, uh, many companies have been moving more towards this self-service reporting to where uh, from both a development standpoint and a report generation standpoint, we, don't, we want people to be able to write their own reports. We don't always want to have to go to an internal IT department or a, a, a developer or hire a developer on staff that is specifically doing reporting. We want to try to push that out to a more self-service type of reporting where really any level of the organization can uh, do report development and then also generate reports so I don't have to have you know, always a manager generating a report to then disseminate out into the company. Now, if I need a report, I can go generate that myself. Uh, and that's where that next kind of line, reporting through all levels of the organization comes in. We want all levels of the organization from top down to really be able to generate reports uh, in a format that suits them. Not a report does not suit every user the same. Even if it is the same type of data, uh, an executive is going to look at data a lot different than uh, a staff accountant might look at it or an accounting manager or something of that fashion. So where do we begin? So when I get a request for a tool, immediately the first thing I really need to do is try to figure out, well, there's all these tools out there that work with GP or uh, any of these ERP systems. What, what tool do I need to use? Sometimes it can be a little overwhelming. Uh, so that's why we kind of narrowed down kind of a little bit of a process we go through. So number one is we're going to determine what our decision factors are. We'll talk about those here in a minute. Then once we have the knowledge uh, of all the available options to us, uh, we can make a better decision. So when I know the strengths of each tool, then I can start applying those to those decision factors. And then lastly, you're going to understand the strengths and benefits. So understand, get knowledge of those options, and then understand the strengths and benefits of each to, again, see what is going to be the best fit uh, for the need. So the decision factors, we've kind of narrowed down, down really to eight. Uh, there could be some others, but these are kind of the, the main kind of eight categories that uh, here at Socius, a lot of the people that write reports is kind of what we use uh, as our decision factors. Uh, so audience is kind of the top one here, first one on the list. And that, that basically comes down to who is going to be the uh, consumer of this report, uh, who's making that request. Um, so that's going to become the audience of my report. It's definitely a factor I need to take into account 
because as I mentioned at the start, not everybody looks uh, at data the same way. So I need to, to consider my audience. Next is my data sources. So that is going to be where is my data currently located? So is it in a, a, a SQL Server database somewhere? Is it um, coming from, a, say, a CRM system? Something like that. I need to take that into consideration as well. Next one is latency. So when we say latency, we're really talking about how often do I need the data refreshed? Everybody that requests a report usually says, I need the data immediately. Um, well, that may not always be the case. Uh, you really have to drill down into uh, the requirement um, to figure out uh, how often they really need that data. Next is a layout. So again, I need to understand uh, what that data may need to look at in an appearance standpoint. Does it need to just be in a, in a format that is an ad hoc, uh, kind of like most of you are probably familiar with smart lists, that ad hoc query type? Uh, do I need some type of a formatted report, like a financial statement? Um, those type things all fall in that layout category. Next is interaction. And when we talk about interaction, is it just going to be a report I print, uh, you know, I generate it, I print it, I'm good? Uh, or do I need to have some user interaction with that? Do I need to have some level of drill downs into that report to drill down into some further detail from a summary level? Do I need to have the ability to export that report? Do I want to interact with the report as far as maybe filtering uh, the results of that report down so that I'm not generating a tremendously large amount of data when I'm really only looking for a specific piece. So all that kind of comes into interaction uh, with the reporting. Next is security. So I obviously have to uh, determine what the audience is to that report, but then also how, what kind of security do I need to that? Do, is the report only for internal purposes? Uh, am I going to have some external source, uh, maybe auditors that come in that you give access to your system? Well, do they need access to these reports? So I've got to also take into consideration the security model I'll need in place um, to determine potentially which tool I need to consider. Next one is infrastructure. So with that one, I need to really understand what the infrastructure I have in place is. Will it support the different tools that I may be considering. So do I need to have a, a separate reporting uh, server set up somewhere to uh, support this, this report I want to do? Or is GP uh, just enough? So we'll talk about a little bit about that. And then the last one is proficiency. And when we talk about proficiency, it's really how easy can that report be built uh, with an internal resource capable of making adjustments to it if needed. Again, so I don't have to always go back to a developer and say, I need you to add a, another column to this report, and it's this big, long, drawn-out process to get a developer or uh, hire somebody to come in and, and do a contract work to modify a report. We really want to make sure we consider how proficient uh, the proficiency level of the tool we choose. So drilling in a little bit on audience. So the kind of four categories that we've kind of identified uh, is some, obviously, uh, different customers can have different ones, but these are pretty safe bet for most. Uh, is, it, is my audience uh, financial? Is it maybe operational uh, that I need to consider? Is it executive level or is it some type of an external audience? Maybe, like I said, auditors or I need to generate uh, a report that I need to send off to a bank um, for funding or, or something of that nature. So those are all going to be examples of, of uh, considering what my audience of the report is going to be. The next decision factor was data sources. So again, we've got to determine what the source of that data is going to be. And we've got some examples on here, GP SQL tables, obviously, different SQL databases, examples of CRM and a data warehouse. Uh, is, is it coming from a custom table or a SQL view? It could be, uh, you know, some custom view that you've had written for you to combine some data. Uh, is it a web server? We've got Excel files on there. So a lot of different sources of data that we do need to uh, take into account when we're trying to figure out the tool to use. 
Next category was latency. So this drills into latency a little bit more and kind of shows you a breakdown of kind of what we consider the, the three latency levels. So first would be that real time, which again is what most users always say their data needs to be. And that's no latency at all. It, it, I generate the report, it's instant, uh, and the data is up to date as of when I ran that report. Next level down from that is what we call near time. And that is where I can refresh uh, or my data gets refreshed at a regular interval. That might be every 30 minutes, it could be every two hours. Uh, it's typically less than a day um, that I've got these regular intervals that my data is getting refreshed. And then the last one is what we call some time. And that might be where uh, it's not a regular interval, it's a set interval to where every night I know my data is going to be refreshed and the next day I've got a new set of data. So those are the three levels of latency that we, uh, we think about. Next is that layout category. So some examples here would be, is it just a, a GP window? Uh, if we're looking at like a, an inquiry window or something like that, uh, do I need to have uh, formatting? And some examples of that would be, do I need lines on my report? Do I need boxes, any type of shading? Anything like that is formatting of a report. Uh, do I need to include subtotals? So, uh, you know, do I need subtotals by customer, by salesperson, whatever I, I may be generating that data for? Do I want to include visuals? So things like charts and graphs. Do I want to be able to do that on this report uh, for the data set that I am writing the report on? Or do I just need simply a grid of data uh, that I might just dump out to Excel and, and perform my own uh, analysis on? Uh, with pivot tables or something like that. Next is interaction. So that would be, uh, again, do I need to have the user be able to interact with the report? So left side is, is just a, a little option drop down box. So maybe I've got a couple different options of how this report uh, can run or generate, uh, filter the data that's in the, the report with, with doing a drop down or a parameter type report. Uh, and then some other examples would be drill throughs. Uh, do I need the ability to trigger off a data refresh right there while I have the report open? Uh, and then again, chart and, craft, uh, chart and graph creation. Those are all interaction type uh, things to think about. When we talk about security, there's really, we've broken it really down to three levels. Uh, one is GP. So uh, for all of you running GP, you have a GP login. That's going to give you security to a, a lot of tools inside of GP, but also some reporting outside of GP uh, that might use SQL level reporting uh, because that is uh, a GP user is a SQL user. So you've got that type of authentication. Then you have Windows authentication, which is the login you use every day when you come in and sit down at your computer and log into your computer. Uh, that is your Windows authenticated user, and that again can also be used to uh, authenticate you to different reporting tools. And then finally, we have a category called outside licensing, uh, and that would be for services like the Power BI uh, service, uh, any of the tools that are um, cloud-based where you actually have to do a separate login that you're kind of outside your network. Now that is using some type of outside licensing. The next category is infrastructure and drilling into that a little bit we've really broken that down into uh, we've got five examples here and that would be uh, is the report that I'm going to be using the tool I'm used is it just inside of GP? Uh, in that case it's in your existing infrastructure. You really don't have to do anything uh, new hardware-wise. Uh, all the infrastructure is in place. Do I need a reporting server? So uh, in, in circumstances where maybe I don't want to impact performance on my GP server, I might think about maybe I need to have another server over here that is strictly used for reporting. Um, so I might need to expand my uh, server infrastructure to accommodate any tools that I might want to set up a, a separate reporting server for. Same thing kind of goes in place for analysis services. If any of the tools that I decide to use rely upon analysis services, I need to make sure I have that uh, installed in my environment 
and potentially uh, the same thing as a reporting server, I might need to have a, a separate server that houses that analysis services engine. So again, I don't impact performance on that production uh, GP server. You can also, if you're just doing open database connections, so if I have a, a GP server and a CRM server, two separate servers, I need to make a connection between them. That would be an ODBC connection. So I just need to make sure from an infrastructure standpoint, ports are open, firewalls allow that connectivity, things like that. And then finally, web services. So any any time that I might need to use any type of uh, tool that is going to rely upon web services or connecting to a website, uh, something of that nature, I definitely need to consider that when I'm thinking about the overall infrastructure uh, environment. Next up is proficiency. So this was kind of our last uh, decision factor we kind of thought about, and we've kind of were able to narrow this down to kind of three main categories as well. One is your typical end user. Uh, you know, I come in every day. I, I you know, I do AP processing. Um, what level of proficiency do I have to write a, a particular uh, AP report? Do I need to go request developers to do that? Um, so if it's an end user type report, then I might want to look at a tool that leans more heavily towards, uh, you know, allowing end users to, to be able to generate those and, and create those reports. Power user is a little bit step over that. We usually think of those as the subject matter experts, maybe admins, uh, somebody that does have a little bit of uh, more technical knowledge than your end users do and might be able to uh, go a little bit further with some reports and write some more advanced reports than an end user would be able to. Uh, and then the last step up from that obviously is a developer level uh, to where it's a little bit beyond what a power user can do and now maybe I do need to really go to developers or contractors or something like that and uh, have those more uh, really complex reports built for me. So that covers all the decision factors. So once we have all those decision factors and we know what we need to consider, then we need to understand the tools that are available to us. Now this obviously isn't uh, a complete list. Um, as many of you who work with GP know, there are a lot of reporting tools out there um, that allow you to report on your data in GP. So we've kind of highlighted some of those, ones that we work with most with, uh, with clients um, are the ones we're kind of focusing on here. So first up, obviously, is native GP. When you think about reporting, that's something people are like, well, that's not really a report. Well, it's getting you the, the answer to the question that you've asked. So we don't want to discard what that standard native GP can do. Uh, and when we talk about native GP, it's really the inquiry windows, your standard uh, report writer reports, and then the word templates that were introduced a few versions back. Next category is the smart list and the smart list designer uh, slash builder. So smart list, again, is inside of GP. It's going to let you do some of that ad hoc. Uh, reporting, and then the designer lets you kind of build your own smart list. So if the data is not available uh, there for me in the out-of-the-box smart list, I do have the ability to create custom ones that I can have show up in smart list just like any other smart list. So it's kind of, uh, it doesn't really uh, look any different to the end user that is using standard smart list versus ones that are designed in designer and or builder. Uh, then there's Excel Report Builder. So uh, same same vein as SmartList, I can build a Excel report that basically utilizes GP straight from uh, or data straight from GP to where uh, you know all those times people go in every month end, they pull up a smart list, they dump the data out, they do some manipulation to it in Excel, uh, and they do that. Every month, they got to go through that process of pulling up their smart list, dumping it out. So what the Excel Report Builder allows me to do is build a connection from Excel. So I just open my workbook, and I start working on it there. I refresh the data from there, and then any other logic I've done after the fact with, say, charts or pivot tables, they're all going to stay intact because my, my data set is refreshing. So it saves you those steps of going through and, 
and doing that export every month, things like that, that depending on the volume, uh, could take quite a while to export that data. Uh, Management Reporter is another tool um, that is kind of seen as the uh, default tool for financial statements. Uh, so most of you people that run GP are going to be running Management Reporter for their financial statements. So uh, that gives us a lot of flexibility in creating professional, uh, well-formatted uh, financial statements. Then we have the Analysis Cubes for Excel, which is a little bit of a, uh, an ad hoc query tool as well that uh, allows us to get data uh, from GP uh, straight to Excel and again do um, dashboarding and uh, pivot tables and charts and graphs. Then we have SSRS, uh, which is a, a, another tool that allows us to go in and write uh, custom tools or custom reports that um, pretty much can connect to a multitude of data sources, GP being one of them, any SQL database really, and, and allowing us to really have very flexible uh, formatting options and um, interaction type options as far as supplying parameters, doing drill downs, uh, things of that nature. Uh, and then Business Analyzer is just kind of a, uh, for any who haven't seen that, it's just an extra add-in install to Dynamics GP that basically lets you point to uh, multiple KPIs or charts that you may have in SSRS and it just kind of cycles through them uh, kind of like a dashboard. If, if any of you have activated that on your home page in GP, you're kind of familiar with what I'm talking about where it cycles through uh, those different little metrics and, and uh, charts that are uh, included. And then the last option we're really talking about is Power BI. And again, it's uh, another dashboarding tool. The great benefit to the Power BI option is it is going to allow you to take a lot of these things mobile. Uh, so a lot of the tools we talked about now, you've kind of got to be on your network uh, to generate these reports or have some avail ability to get into your network. Power BI is one of those outside services. So I can log in uh, just like I would be logging into like my Outlook uh, Office 365 account uh, and then I could view that data and I could do that on a, in an iPad, a Galaxy device, uh, the Microsoft uh, tablets. Uh, the surfaces, the uh, you know, even on my phone, I can pull up my Power BI reports if I need to while I'm on the road, view uh, you know, view data or dashboards that help me you know keep track of what's going on. So now drilling into each tool, kind of how these are are designed. You'll see a slide like this for each tool. Uh, I'm obviously not going to, for time's sake, not going to read every single block that's on these. Uh, but basically what each tool, what each slide does is break out our uh, decision factors. You can see audience interaction and so on, and then fits in uh, what kind of that is good at. So from an inquiry standpoint, for, for uh, demonstration here, you've got financial and operational, because those people normally are in GP anyway, if they have a need that they're asking a question that can be answered there, they can get that through the inquiry window. There's drill back links. So from an interaction standpoint, I can drill back um, all the way back to my source transactions in GP because they're all linked together. Um, you can see that the latency there is real time uh, because I'm in GP. When I run a report or look at an inquiry window, it's as of that data, as that data sits right then. There's no lag time there. Uh, and then obviously the proficiency user is your typical end user who's, you know, your day-to-day, -day, they're getting into GP. They're very familiar with it. Uh, they know how to navigate uh, the system. So it's a very quick view to that data. And sometimes it's just one that gets discounted uh, when people think they really do need a report. Um, and, then when, and when us as report writers can then question, well, do we really need to write a whole report for this when the data is kind of right there for you? Um, so it's just something to think about and, and something to ask uh, when you get requests for reports. The next area of GP is those standalone, uh, out-of-the-box report writer reports. Um, for many of you who have been on GP uh, for a long time, know they haven't made very many updates to that, and they're, they're not the prettiest looking reports. 
uh, but they do a lot of times present the information that is needed. So if it's not where I need uh, you know, a really nice laid out report, I just need the information, potentially running those out of the box reports is going to give the user what they need without spending you know, an investment in writing a, an elaborate pretty report to provide them the same exact data. Um, so again, you can see there are those uh, the boxes. And like I said, you, these slide decks will be available. Um, but you can just see the ones that are kind of jumping out a little bit different. This one now from a proficiency level has also added in developers because if I need to go in and make changes to these report writer reports, if anybody has tried that, you probably uh, get disgusted every time you open it because it's so tiny. Um, and it's, it's kind of hard to know where to get the data in there and get it just right. So we usually let uh, report developers um, handle those modifications. Uh, the third area within native GP is those native JP, uh, or this is a screenshot of those native reports. So that hopefully looks familiar to a lot of you. Uh, detailed historical trial balance out of the AR module. So again, it provides the data I need. It's not the prettiest looking report, uh, but it gives me what I need. So again, why write another report uh, when I can already get that data? And then the third area is those word templates we talked about. So those got added a couple versions ago um, where for things like that are going to be more uh, customer or vendor facing documents, uh, they did those in, in a Microsoft Word type format so that uh, when I generate, say, a sales invoice with a word template, it's going to look a little nicer and give me a little bit more ability to put maybe a logo on it, uh, something like that. It just looks a little cleaner and more professional than those out-of-the-box report writer reports. Um, so you'll see, a, uh, I'll just point out on here that that layout has changed for our, our, our layout decision factor to be, now this is more, more of a formatted uh, type report, um, and that the infrastructure, I do need to have uh, Microsoft Word there uh, to make modifications to those templates. They'll work out of the box. I don't have to have the plug-in to do that. I just need to plug in if I need to make changes to those Word templates. And then this would be a, a example of what that would look like coming out in a Word template. So a little bit different looking and more cleaner looking than the report writer uh, formats. Smart list designer or builder is the next one. So you'll see quite a few uh, decision uh, trees here changed. So my interaction kind of is the big change here uh, along with data sources. So my interaction now, I've got the ability to do drill throughs. Uh, I can filter my data down. I can force data refreshes, uh, things like that. Uh, and then from a data standpoint, data source standpoint, I now have access to data outside of GP. So now I can bring in data from additional databases or SQL views into my smart list so that users that are in smart list already or in GP can go into their smart list and, and view data that might not even reside inside of GP. So I'm going to flip over real quick to my uh, instance here. So once I'm inside of GP, you have a new button. So if you have designer, you will see these buttons up top, new and modify. If you have builder installed, those will still be there because the designer is part of GP, but you won't access your smart list builder objects through designer. They're two separate tools, so there will be another window for that. But your designer ones, if I want to click a new one, I would just do new. You basically would give it a name, tell it what the product is installed that you're writing this data against. So if I want uh, GP data and I'm going to be writing a customer summary report, I want to put that smart list in the sales series so that my GP users, when they go under sales, they're going to see this new smart list called customer summary. You're then going to drill into your database view here and find your customer table. So 
the good thing about this is it does a pretty good job of putting a friendly name on these tables. Uh, so for any of you who actually have gone and wrote more complex ones against the SQL database, you know, see those RM200 whatever tables. For an end user, they're not going to know that stuff. Um, so they did a pretty good job of putting that metadata here uh, that allows me to see my customer master summary table. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and check that. And then you'll see that up top, it went ahead and it selected all of these fields for me. And I can scroll through, and if there's ones that I don't want, I would just click them and remove them from the list. So you're basically going through and picking and removing fields that you don't want uh, in that smart list. Then if you need to bring back more data, uh, potentially from a different table, you're going to have to join that together. But again, they've made it kind of easy with these friendly names to do that. So if I select that my table is my master summary and my customer number, and I want to be able to pull back, say, my customer name, which is not in my summary table, I would join out And of course, it's not going to put it there. Let's do that. So back to here. Customer number. I'm going to join out. And I want to join to that customer master address table. And I'm going to join on that customer number. So that's the important thing is to make sure I'm joining to those tables on that key value. Then you do have the ability to filter the data if you want to. So if I wanted to only pull back where my customer balance is more than, let's say, $1,000, I could type that in and it's going to filter back that list. And then to check your data, you simply hit Execute Query up top. And then down here in the grid, blow this up a little bit for everybody. I'll be able to blow it up. No. Uh, but it'll basically have each column that got returned from that query to where I can start looking through that data. But that'll give you an idea of exactly what the smart list is going to return uh, in the smart list inside of GP when you when you create this. And then when you're done, you just say OK, and it'll add it as a, a new option inside of the uh, smart list in GP. Okay, so the next one is Management Reporter. And again, we talked about this one being really the, the, uh, the default tool we're, we're going to use or, or most times go to uh, by default when we need to write a financial statement. It's really what that tool is very good at and what it was designed really to provide from a, a reporting solution. Uh, so you'll see here that my audience, usually that's just going to be my financial and my executive uh, staff. Uh, the latency on that is a little bit of both real time and some time because I can both generate a report and get the data as is, or I can schedule my MR reports to run, say, at month end or whatever, to where or nightly, um, whatever it may be, that they'll run on some schedule. Uh, and then also there is a tad of a delay uh, when I post something in GP. If that is having to transmit to the management reporter data mark, there is a, a short amount of time there that that data has got to get to that data mark. So if I run the report immediately after I post it, it might not reflect it. But if I give it a couple seconds and refresh the report, uh, it should provide that data I just posted. The additional thing I can do as far as layouts is not only can I format these reports, I can also include subtotals. So, uh, you know, by the first segment of my GL account or by, you know, my account category of cash. Uh, any of these type things, I can now do subtotals on that report. There is drill through ability. So I can start at a summarized level in MR and drill down all the way down to a transactional detail level if my report is designed to generate that transaction level detail. I can drill all the way down to it. Um, and then from an infrastructure standpoint, you can store this right on your GP database. Um, 
but you also can spin off a separate reporting server uh, to, to do that. And that's kind of a from proficiency level, that tool is really a, a meant to be an end user tool. Um, usually with, uh, you know, a couple days of training with a management reporter, you know, your typical users are, are going to be able to write these reports and not have to get, you know, developers or IT involved uh, in that reporting process. So, and let me switch over here again and show you what the output of that would look like. So some of these I've already generated to, to save time, but this is what an output of a management reporter rolling quarter would look like. So you're not really going to get anything out of GP that looks like this. This, this allowed me to do some nice formatting and put uh, the, the three months of a quarter uh, in the left-hand columns there with my account descriptions in the center instead of which, you know, typically users always are used to seeing those descriptions as the first column in a report. So this is a little, just a demonstration of something you could do a little bit different, you know, to add a little flavor uh, to your financial statement. And then on the right, we've got the year-to-date balance um, for the entire year. So three months worth of current and then a year-to-date balance uh, at the end. meant to do the drill down in there as well. So if I wanted to drill into, say, my salaries expenses here, if I just hover over, you get to, I'll do other expenses, you get hover over and then it's going to drill in and there's where I can see that, that drill down into that account level and if there's transaction level detail, I can click and then drill down into that as well and get all the way down into a, a transaction level uh, detail on this report. within. Management Reporter. So the next tool is the Analysis Cubes for Excel. So you'll see here, now we're going to start getting into some of the tools that are really going to open up uh, and be good options for a lot of our decision factors. Um, so we can see that our audience really is anybody internal to the organization can really get use uh, out, of, uh, out of these uh, cubes, whether it's just using a simple pivot table going to a full dashboard type of uh, report. The data source for it uh, is a data warehouse. So that is one kind of, uh, the, the data source and the infrastructure is something when we utilize this tool or think about using it, we need to make sure that that from a data source and an infrastructure standpoint, those things are in place. Uh, the latency on that is some time because again, it's not, a, it's not something that is going to refresh as I post transactions in GP. There is a set time that my cubes refresh. Uh, I can add from a layout standpoint, I can add visuals now uh, to a lot of my uh, reports. Uh, from an interaction, I can create charts and graphs. I can filter that data. I, again, I can force a data refresh. Um, however, again, in the cubes, normally the data in the warehouse isn't getting refreshed. So continually refreshing your spreadsheet really isn't going to change that data. Uh, unless you've had uh, IT or somebody run a refresh of your data, say at month end, we get a lot of requests um, to have their warehouse refreshed a couple times a day, potentially, um, while they're posting closing entries and things like that. Uh, and then again, from proficiency level, just like audience, it's really open to everybody. End users, uh, like I mentioned, can go in and create pretty simple uh, pivot table reports. And then developers can write uh, and power users also can write uh, pretty uh, pretty extensive dashboards with uh, cube formulas and things like that. So this next slide is just a quick example of uh, some uh, charts and graphs and, and pivot tables behind those uh, that can be generated in the analysis cubes. So we've got a top 10 customers uh, by total sales there that's driving our total top 10 customer chart. We have a sales forecast by top items, uh, and then we have a, uh, an aging uh, bucket um, graph there, and then a pivot table in the background there with the sales, gross margin, net income um, by month. <clears throat> the next tool is the SQL reporting services. So, Many of you, this comes with GP now. It has for uh, at least the past three, four versions. 
Uh, it just might not be deployed in your environment, but you already own it. Um, and there's a way right through GP to deploy it. There's, I want to say, 160 reports that you are basically given uh, by deploying these reports, uh, already built, uh, and will run. A lot of them are duplicates of the reports that are those old report writer reports, like the trial balances, things like that. They are just, uh, they look a little bit better, uh, and they can be exported to Excel a little cleaner. Um, for anybody who's tried to export a report writer report to Excel um, would know that challenge. Uh, but just kind of like with the analysis cubes for this one, you'll see that these decision factors are really, this tool is good for a lot of them. Um, got, it can handle all latency types, all layouts, all the different kind of interaction I might want to have. It has a mixed security model, so I can use SQL logins, I can use uh, those Windows logins, uh, Windows authenticated logins. Um, proficiency level on this is going to be a little above an end user. Uh, however, it usually is going to be more of a power user slash developer to uh, create the reports, but then your typical end user can definitely run the reports, interact with them, um, do things like that. Uh, and this typically we do have to have uh, a separate server um, to run on again so that we don't impact uh, performance on our GP production server. So I'll flip over real quick again to just give you a quick demo of what that would look like. So again I mentioned this should be, uh, if many of you, if you don't have it deployed yet, once you get it deployed this is basically what you would see is you would have a home page uh, for SSRS that would include a company folder for each GP company that you have. And you would drill into that, and then you'll see that there are folders uh, for each kind of uh, series within GP. So my financial modules, uh, my purchasing modules, things like that. So if I click in a folder, then I'm going to have a number of reports available to me. Uh, like I said, some of these are going to be duplicates of reports that already exist in Report Writer. They're just going to be a little better formatted and a little easier to export. And then there's also some charts and KPIs uh, that are provided to you, and that are, those are typically the things you usually see on your home page if you have these deployed. And what that would look like, I've pulled up a uh, purchase order history report just to kind of show you how I would interact with this. So I went up and I hit, there's a drop down, so this is a parametized report where I can supply uh, either one or multiple purchase order numbers, or all, that I want to get this purchase order history for. When I view this report, you'll notice it's pulled back. Both of these POs kind of rolled up. I don't really know the details of this, but it's a way to kind of consolidate the, the report when it first opens. And then I can simply drill down into the detail uh, to see the line items on that purchase order. And so now I got each line item with its subtotal, and then I can again drill into uh, the next one, and then I can shrink the one that I don't need anymore. So I've got that interaction um, with the report, and like I mentioned, I can export these out to PDF, Excel format, so there's more interaction with the report than just uh, generating it and printing it out. Uh, our next tool is the Power BI tool. So uh, just like with the analysis cubes and SSRS, it, it's a very powerful tool that, that again, satisfies or opens up a lot of these decision factors and can be a good solution for a lot of our decision factors that we discuss. Uh, so, so again, I've got all internal resources can be consumers of this. It, it can touch all data sources. Uh, it can be all latencies. Uh, I, I can do visuals, formatting. Uh, Anybody really can use it. Um, it's a very efficient tool once you learn how to use it uh, and pretty easy to uh, develop your dashboards. Uh, the big outlier here are the security and the infrastructure. So from a security standpoint, you do have to have an Office 365 um, subscription, which goes into that infrastructure as well with your Power BI license, uh, because you are logging into an external uh, source. So that's that outside licensing um, that we talked about. 
and quick demo of what that would look like. So we've got a couple sample uh, dashboards here of a Power BI dashboard. So again, dashboarding, you're not really thinking about uh, like pivot tables or something like that. This really is a, a very, uh, a tool with very heavily with visualizations uh, and graphs and charts and dials and things like that that I can then, uh, you know, manipulate. So if I wanted to interact with this and say I only wanted to see 2016, I have a filter box here that if I click, my report will refresh and you'll see that everything on the canvas reflected 2016. So it's all tied together on that canvas. So I filter one time and I can then readjust all the data that's on here. You can also interact with it. So if I wanted to uh, click and drill in and click this column here, you'll see that up top these shifted a little bit too. It might have happened really quick for you. But if I do it again, you'll see all those things shift because they're all interconnected to each other. Uh, so it's a good way to you know, maintain that consistency of what I'm looking at, knowing my other charts are backing up that data. All right, so one other category that I tacked on here at the end is it's not really something we typically consider one of our GP uh, tools when we were thinking about reporting tools around GP. And that's what's called CPM, uh, or, or Corporate Performance Management is what it stands for. So basically, after we think about reporting, the question might get asked, well, what if I need to also do budgeting? Okay, so all the tools you've shown me so far are really just running on my actual data in GP, or potentially uh, my financial budgets that I've imported into GP. Well, what if I need to do a little more uh, budgeting that doesn't really go to my GL accounts, or maybe I want to budget headcount, or uh, I want to now, instead of having one person do the budget, I want to, you know, disseminate out that work and, and, and delegate it out to my department heads and say, hey, you, you budget your department, you budget your department. Uh, that's where these three tools kind of can come in and help uh, assist with that. So they are a combination of a reporting tool and a budgeting tool. And the three that we partner with uh, are Adaptive uh, Insights, BI360 from Solver, and then DeFacto from DeFacto Global. And I just got a couple of quick slides to just give you some screenshots of what that might look like. So from an adaptive planning standpoint, you have what looks like a, a grid sheet here. Uh, and what that's going to do is I can have actuals pull into this, but I can also have sheets uh, that allow me to data to data input. So again, if I'm trying to budget um, for like this screenshot has personnel assumptions. So if I'm trying to budget out by month, uh, how many uh, headcount that I am going to add, uh, I can budget that out, enter it directly in here, uh, and then use that in reporting in this tool that will allow me to combine it kind of with data coming out of my actual ERP. Uh, BI360 does uh, a similar, it's another CPM tool, similar type thing. It allows me to read actuals um, and also uh, do uh, the budgeting standpoint. So again, I can read data from GP, but I also have the ability to input data into uh, uh, templates that then save that data back to their data warehouse, the BI360 data warehouse, so then I can do the same thing. I can do actual versus uh, budgeting data uh, reporting uh, inside of this tool as well. And then the last one that we uh, I mentioned that we partnered with is de facto. So again, it's just another, they all look kind of similar. They're all grid-based looking, um, but it all accomplishes kind of the same thing. I can get actuals from my actual financial data, and then I can use the budget amounts from amounts that I am keying into this tool, um, or my department managers may be keying into this tool. All right, so getting down towards the end here. So kind of the final thoughts is bringing all, bringing all this information together. So 
threw a lot of information at you. Uh, like I mentioned, you will get these slides and hopefully go back through those slides that had the, the grids on them that kind of pointed out the different uh, decision factors. But now that I know the challenges uh, and the strengths of each tool, now I can usually make a good decision on what is going to be the right tool uh, or the best choice for each situation. Because like I said at the very beginning, one tool is not going to be the right answer for every question uh, posed to you uh, inside your organization. Okay? Each tool has its strengths and its weaknesses, and that's our job as report writers to figure out and understand what those challenges are, what the requirements are, and then which tool is going to fit best for that. So I mentioned at the beginning I had a couple examples uh, to kind of let you kind of see how you would kind of go about uh, doing this. So the first one is just an HATB report. So typical, something uh, normally everybody runs at the end of the month. Uh, usually I would go run a receivables historical age trial balance. That usually is going to get, answer the question to me, who owes me money? You know, which of my customers owe me money? And then have my customers pay me on time? So, you know, your typical aging. Um, so there's a couple things we, we know our tools now. So we think back and we say, okay, well, which ones could potentially work? We know native GP does. We know it has a historical trial balance. But we've also said that the formatting isn't very good. I can't export it out if I need to take that data and do something else with it. I can run it, I can review the data, and I can print it. Outside of that, I'm kind of limited with it. So that might not be the best option. It would give the answer, but it might not be the best option here. When we think about maybe the smart list, well, that's not going to really get us uh, in a good format, uh, you know, our aging or anything like that. It doesn't have totals per customer. We would have to do a smart list uh, designer, um, custom designer smart list for that. Um, so that might not really be a tool to really consider um, for this type of a report. We know MR isn't going to really solve this problem for us because MR doesn't touch our subledgers. It's really just what's in that uh, general ledger module. So then we're kind of down to those last three that were really the really wide open choices that we talked about um, in ACE, SSRS, uh, and Power BI. Okay. So that I have a slide for each of these to show you how that would kind of look. So here would be what it would look like as an SSRS solution. So it looks similar to the base GP one, um, but again, I have the added flexibility of maybe adding uh, some drill back into this. I can export this to Excel really easily. So to me, this is a, 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 probably the, the first option I would think about doing is because this already is a report in that SSRS package if you have it deployed. So it wouldn't even be a new report I'd have to build. Um, but I could then tweak it uh, and maybe make it a little bit better um, suited for the users that are requesting it. Another thing that could answer that same question is the analysis cubes. So I could go in to the analysis cubes and I could build a quick pivot table on my aging and then I could uh, uh, by customer and then I could also throw a uh, chart on there that has the um, buckets as a whole. Okay, so that gives me the answer uh, to those questions. And then the third one is Power BI could also answer that question for me. So again, I've got a, a chart on the left that's my aging. Instead of a pie, it's a, a line graph showing me my aging buckets. The middle one's a little busy of a, a chart there. Um, so it may or may not be helpful, but it kind of shows in a pie chart, uh, you know, your distribution of your uh, amounts owed by customers. And then there's just a list that is inside of a dashboard that gives me by customer the balance uh, that they owe me. Okay. So all three of those uh, would be um, potentially very good solutions to that question. It really would just come down to is it supported by your infrastructure um, and what, you know, and those other decision factors of, you know, who, who needs to use the report, right? Do they need to be power user or, um, you know, is it something an end user could do? <clears throat> and my second example would be uh, something else we get asked a lot or, or a lot of time accountants are asking for is a departmental expense report. Okay. So 
question is there, which department is spending the most money? Uh, which expenses are the highest, right? So uh, I, need, I, I need a report to kind of help me gauge uh, those so that I can, you know, maybe potentially reduce the spending or I can see if I might need to go see if I can get, you know, discounts from a vendor that I might be spending a lot of money with. So again, I start thinking about GP. So is there anything really in GP that's going to give me this? There's not really a standard report that would answer it uh, kind of without having to make a change to it. Um, smart list, same thing. There's not really a, a way that the smart list gives you a total by department. Yes, you could mine the data and dump it to Excel and then go through a manual process, but that's kind of goes back to what we talked about a little bit earlier. Now I've got to do a repeatable process uh, to get that data. So that's probably not a good option either. Then we come to management reporter. Well, we know that uh, normally one of the segments of our GL is a department. Uh, we know GL data is an MR. So it's definitely a potential uh, tool to do this type of reporting on. Uh, ACE is also an option because, again, we've got that data, the financial data there. We know the segments, so we can separate it uh, by segments there. Same thing with SSRS. Uh, it would be a good tool, but again, there's nothing out of the box that has it. So it would be a good tool to do it, but I would have to create that report. So it's not something that would probably maybe be really quick because I would have to generate a new report for that. And then lastly, we have Power BI again, which again is a great solution for that. Uh, if I want to have it kind of in a, a dashboard type format of my vendor spend, um, and then which departments maybe are spending the most money in a graphical uh, dashboard view that really jumps out at, say, an executive who might have asked for this data in the first place. They can see, wow, that, you know, 75% of my chart is going to that department. What are you, what are you guys spending money on? Um, so it's very visual uh, and very easy to understand. So we've got a couple spreadsheets here, again, to demonstrate what those might look like. So from an analysis cube solution, We've got a, uh, a pivot table there that breaks out the January expen uh, expense amounts for those departments. And then uh, on the uh, kind of in the background left-hand side, you've got the chart based off that pivot table that graphs it. So I can see my service and installation uh, has got the uh, highest spend there. In SSRS, I could... Uh, you know, create a report that would look something similar to this. It's a little nice, cleaner looking format. Uh, I've got my department's uh, numbers and their descriptions on the left. I've got the month periods on the top and then the amounts in there. So again, I can come up with a really good format uh, in SSRS. And if I wanted to uh, get really fancy, I could have added drill downs to where I can drill into that department and get, you know, a little more detail uh, under there, maybe at an account level or something like that. <clears throat> and then lastly, we've got the departmental expense from MR. Okay, so again, I can see that inside of my operating expense category here, the first segment of my chart basically is going to break out uh, that, that department for me. So I could roll that all up uh, if I wanted to inside of MR to just show me one line for the 200s, one line for the 100s, uh, and so on. And that's a pretty quick and uh, easy report to generate an MR because, again, it, it knows that the segment is your department segment. All right, so that is the uh, uh, end of the uh, webinar for today. Uh, this, is a, this slide just kind of has what to look for. So our next one around GP is April 11th. That one will be covered covering leveraging uh, multi-currency in GP, same time, one to two. We have our Aspire client events. Those are coming up uh, May 9th in Columbus, Ohio, and May 16th uh, here in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, registration is open to that. Uh, most of you have probably started getting the uh, registration invites um, for that in an email or somebody in your organization has been. Uh, and then, uh, obviously, visit our website uh, to view the remaining uh, webinar series for 2017. And I have a slide at the end as well that has my contact information um, so that when you look at the slides, you don't have to scroll all the way back up. So at this point, we can take uh, questions, Lindsay, I guess. 
All right. Um, the first question that we have is, of the three budgeting tools that you mentioned, which are the, which are the ones you've implemented the most? Uh, I would say we have probably actually implemented all three of them about the same amount. Uh, de facto is probably a little bit less, and when I say a little bit less, maybe like two uh, less than BI360. And then um, we have just started really doing the adaptive. We partnered with them last year. They were doing a lot of the implementations themselves, uh, but we have staff now that can do that, and I think we are on like our fourth or fifth uh, adaptive uh, deployment. Great. That is all the questions I have. Um, if you do have any other questions, you can reach out to Chris. Um, but if not, we will end for today, and thanks everyone for joining. Thank you.